going to begin this, uh, this study here. This is the first in this series, and this is mostly just going to be an introduction um, today and, and probably actually for a little while. Um, the series I've decided to call, um, I can't even remember what I called it here. So it's called um, uh, The Lines Simply Presented. So, you know, that's a challenge for me. But mostly it's just that we're going to take our time and lay a really solid foundation. Um, obviously, if you read the, these notes I have here, I'm not writing in the simplest language I could. But these were written a while ago. So I'd started writing these out when we began, well, a year ago when we began um, understanding the lines, that series, but I got caught up in writing other papers. So, and I started moving so far ahead, I never finished this. And also our study went a lot, a lot more in depth than I had intended. So we've been doing this study in the mornings since December 26th uh, of, the, of this year or last year, I guess, 2021. And um, uh, this morning we had completed study number 251 and tomorrow will be number 252. But for people who have not been following those studies, and I know some people have followed them here and there, uh, they've become fairly um, involved. That is, it's not easy just to jump into those studies and see what we're talking about. Now, as far as how simple uh, this study is going to be, I mean, often I gauge what the audience is able to take in. Uh, I know that doesn't sound quite um, accurate to most people's minds because I tend to stretch people a little bit. I do that as a guitar teacher as well. Um, but, you know, if I'm having interaction, I can see that people are, are taking the time to study and follow it. They can usually follow along. Um, here I'm going to, you know, back up a little bit. And it's just going to be a one-hour study. We're not going to um, present too many ideas. Some of this is, is simply a review for most of us. But I think there's always going to be something for everyone, even those that have uh, been studying on a regular basis. So uh, before we begin this study, we're going to begin with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so very grateful um, for all the things that you have been teaching us over the years, especially in this past year as we have struggled in understanding uh, the lines of prophecy, uh, the reform lines uh, from the beginning of creation until our present time. And um, we know, Lord, that there's much that we do not understand. But we know as we uh, come to review these things in a much simpler way uh, that this will help us. Um, I pray for those watching, for those participating, um, that your Holy Spirit can speak to their hearts. We know, Lord, how much we need your truths. Um, and we just ask that in some way that we can understand these things in a, in a way that we can present to others. We pray for those around us that we know and love uh, who need to experience a reformation in their lives, just as we do. And so we just ask that um, as you work in our hearts, that it'll have an effect upon others. Be with us now through thy spirit, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so again, welcome. Now, I'm just going to read through some of my notes that I have here. So again, these were written about a year ago, um, <clears throat> and some of these things, of course, we're very familiar with, but I'm just going to start reading these here, and then we're going to just draw some simple things out here and make sure that if, if there's something that, that is not clear to you that you don't understand or you think needs to be clarified, feel free to participate. <clears throat> 
So there's no better way to place the stories of scripture into the memory than to understand their innate patterns. These patterns are not merely mnemonic devices or analytical tools, though they serve both functions, but are prophetic types. Um, so just to comment on that a little bit, <clears throat> uh, when I first started showing the lines to my nephew, Daniel, who is not an Adventist, and he was at that time really involved in studying the Bible, reading it all the time. For him, the Bible came to life. I mean, he had not seen, this was in 2018, just before we went down to Arkansas. And so I was showing him some of the things like the week of Christ and things like that. Um, but also the story of Joseph and the story of Ezra, just different stories in scripture. And, and he had known these stories, but had never seen um, these stories in this way. So they are analytical tools in that way. Uh, but they also uh, help us to remember these stories. When you start to look at a structure of a story, um, the story um, becomes uh, fixed into our memory in various ways, especially when we start to see these patterns and we compare them with other stories. Um, but the main thing is that these are types. These are types. What's happened, as the Apostle Paul says, after giving a brief account of the Exodus, states that all these things happened unto them for in samples or types. The, the Greek word there is typos. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. That's 1 Corinthians 10, 11. While many see the stories of scripture as merely moral lessons, Paul is suggesting that the events of the past are prophetic types of what is to come. Simply, history is prophecy, especially the history that is found in the scriptures. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Romans 15, 4. The latter part of this verse can be paraphrased as that we, by constant endurance and through the pleadings of the Holy Spirit, can know what to expect in the future, right? So I'm taking those, those words, patience, which means constant endurance, and the pleadings of the Holy Spirit, that's the work of the comforter, right? That's, I'm taking that word comfort and expanding it, um, and might know what to expect in the future. Because the idea of hope there uh, is not just... Uh, wishful thinking, but it's actually an expectation of something that is to come. So <clears throat> that's why I've paraphrased it this way. Um, and this is something that, you know, we, we definitely can show people yeah, when we're telling, because right now I see, you know, people who uh, would understand these lines fairly well. But when I'm going to show things to people, because I'm doing a study on Friday afternoons with non-Adventists, and I'm, I'm showing them right now we're in our seven, we did seven studies so far, I believe, um, and we're um, in, we started in Genesis 1, and we're on Genesis verse 1, verse 16, so, so, you know, maybe it's our eighth study, so let's say, you know, two verses a day, um, so we're going fairly slowly, but of course, we're looking at lots of other scriptures, and, and we're making an application of the creation of the world, both as a reform line, but also as our personal experience. And so when we share with others, uh, we're not just showing them prophecy. We should be showing them something that they can connect to their lives. And that's what I've been doing with the people that have been at that study. And, and people are seeing it, even though they're struggling with some of the uh, – the ideas that they've never heard before, um, they, because they can make this connection with their personal life, it's helping them to see it. <clears throat> now, to, to help us see these patterns, these patterns of scripture, God has given us simple instruction found in Isaiah 28. Now, of course, we're, we're familiar with this passage. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? 
them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. That's Isaiah 28, verses 9 to 10. Now, the Hebrew, I mean, I, I just find this really fascinating, actually, so I don't know if everybody else does. But the Hebrew is written or expressed as a child's rhyme. So, you know, God is trying to speak to us in the simplest terms. Now, uh, here it's uh, the transliteration. That is, if you just put it into English, is ki, tsav, letsav, tsav, letsav, kav, lekav, kav, lekav, zahari, sham, zahari, sham. So that's the Hebrew. That's how it would sound. Um, I actually have a recording of a native, uh, I think they're what they call the Ashkenazi. I can't remember which one's which. He's maybe Sephardic. I, I, I can't remember which. He's anyway one of the groups that's local uh, to Israel uh, reading uh, the Old Testament. And, and he has this here. And it, it sounds really cool when he reads it. But anyway, this is a child's rhyme. Now, why would God be speaking to, to his people in this child's rhyme? Why this little childlike rhyme, like a nursery rhyme type of thing? Well, you have the oh, language. Helpful. Go ahead, Stephen. I'm just saying you have the, the language of being drawn from the breasts. You mm -hmm. have like a, a childlike imagery there. Mm -hmm. So therefore, this would sort of connect that. Yeah, right. So, so this is, he's speaking to us like a child because um, that's what we are. But he wants to lead us further. And so couched in this childlike rhyme is something quite deep. What this reminds me of is uh, the poems of William Blake, especially the Songs of Innocence and the Songs of Experience. And, and there's these two groups of poetry. Um, so the Songs of Innocence describe faith in a childlike way. Um, like little lamb who made thee, dost thou know who made thee? You know, and that talks about how Jesus was once a lamb. And of course, the child doesn't understand that um, what that means. It just the child just thinks of the lamb as this cute little animal. But of course, couched in that is um, the fact that Christ is going to die on the cross um, for us, right? And and then there is the the sister. Uh, verse which is in songs of experience which is the one tiger tiger burning bright in the jungles of the night um so he has these these poems paired you know someone's dealing with the chimney sweeper and so forth and what you see is that even in the childish rhymes um the the, the poems that are the songs of innocence there's the seed of experience but once you go through experience that faith becomes deepened so so that's one of the things it reminds me of but here this this role and and angela you had a thought did, did, could you add it was it any different than what stephen was saying is something you can add well it was, it was not much much uh i was just uh, saying that he wanted to remind us that he's our father and in his eyes we are all children we were reliant on him for everything okay and that that's not Little, that's something quite important. Um, just, I don't know why I got this capital T here. Just gonna... Okay. And now, so he's, he's got this childhood rhyme, but in it is this very clear or direct um, plan of how to study the word. So this, if we're going to translate this more literally, though, I put in these square brackets, uh, words just to, to show that they're added words to make the sentence 
clearer, but I'm translating the Hebrew more uh, literally. Uh, this means correctly set in order, to order. Measure on a line to measure. From this point in time to that point in time. So what he's asking us to do is place the events of scripture upon a measuring line, that's that word kav, in chronological order. So this is, this to, to me was a revelation. This is the, the main thing that I found by coming into this movement here uh, in studying the lines and studying Adventist history and seeing that when we place these events on a line, we could recognize things, especially chronologically, that we wouldn't have been able to note. Um, so it became a very powerful way. So one is, of course, we can, we can see it, right? Um, I mean, we can see relationships, especially as we put lines up on top of each other. Uh, the context of this passage is in regarding is regarding the false interpretations of prophecy that come from the drunkards of Ephraim through the influence of the false worship of northern Israel. It is symbolized as wine, which causes them to err in vision and stumble in judgment. So that's in, in verse 7 of chapter 28. So it's, it's given here to these drunkards who now... They're drunk, of course, with the teachings, the false doctrines of the nations around them. And he wants to instruct them. And he's taking them as children. And it's, um, then I wrote, more than this, it causes them to vomit, vomit upon the tables, which we take as a reference to the prophetic tables of Habakkuk 2, verse 2. Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. So, of course, we could apply this to the tables of the law as well, because they are parallel with each other. Now, in some ways, what, what I'm presenting here is a little bit advanced. That is, somebody who would be looking at this at the first time uh, might wonder at these parallels. But one of the things we see when we start to deal with these lines is I can take a line of history and, and see that it follows a particular pattern. And then I can take another line of history or prophetic story or, or events in the Bible. And when I draw that line, I can see that that line runs parallel to this other line and that the details or the way marks in each of these lines speak to each other. That is, they are types, prophetic types. So the events in the past are types of what's going to happen in the future. And some of those things that our types have already met, in a sense, their anti-type. That is, they have been fulfilled. But even though they've been fulfilled, they all come together at the end of the world to give an illustration of the time that we live in. So in Habakkuk 2, 2 where it says, write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. The Hebrew word that is translated as run means to break down Divide quickly. As says the wise man, when thou goest, thy step shall not be straightened, that is confined to a narrow path. And when thou runnest, thou shalt not stumble. That's Proverbs 4.12. This method of Bible study, as suggested by Isaiah 28, gives us a broad and deep analysis of Scripture. False methods of study, as seen in the many, many man-made methods of interpretation, cause us to err and stumble. They lead us down false paths. So for somebody who's going to be studying the lines, um, and you know, for many of you, of course, you're familiar with these ideas, but we know that these false methods of study, these man-made methods, um, they come from the Catholic Church, they come from a type of analysis of non-sacred literature that is just, you know, ancient documents. Um, it's, the, it's a system of analysis that does not, uh, when you apply it to the Bible, is not really 
seeking to have the Holy Spirit be the interpreter of Scripture. It's man's intellect. So the true methods of study uh, are drawn from God's word by comparing Scripture with Scripture. Now, one of the things, of course, we know um, is that most people would look at this line upon line as a line of Scripture or a passage of Scripture, because that's how we've always understood it. But that's not what the Hebrew is saying. It doesn't mean that that's incorrect, but in a sense, that's skipping a step. Because when we go through uh, the scriptures, we're looking not just at the verse itself and comparing the words, but we're also comparing the history, the way marks, the story. And that's really what line upon line is about. And we set these things in order. And, and we set them in an order, order chronologically. They give us this insight that we wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, yeah, so there's some uh, references there Angela has, which we'll, we'll skip for now, because we're going to come to some of these ideas. <clears throat> now, um, so this paper, or this study, uh, looks at the great performatory movements of Scripture, sets them on a line and shows the connection of past histories with the present being guide, guided by statements such as these. So we should be all familiar with these statements, but I'll read them. Uh, we are to see in history the fulfillment of prophecy, to study the workings of providence, that would be God's um, leading, what God provides, in the great refor reformatory movements, and to understand the progress of events in the marshalling of the nations for the final conflict of the great controversy. So that's from A Testimonies, page 307. <clears throat> and this next one's from Education. As too often taught, history is little more than a record of the rise and fall of kings, the intrigues of court, the victories and defeats of armies, a story of ambition and greed, of deception, cruelty, and bloodshed. Thus taught, its results cannot but be detrimental. The heart-sickening reiteration of crimes and atrocities, the enormities, the cruelties portrayed, plant seeds that in many lives bring forth fruit in an evil harvest of evil. Far better is it to learn in the light of God's word the causes that govern the rise and fall of kingdoms. Let the youth study these records and see how the true prosperity of nations has been bound up with an acceptance of the divine principles. Let him study the history of the great reformatory movements and see how often these principles, though despised and hated, their advocates brought to the dungeon and to the scaffold, have through these very sacrifices triumphed. Now, of course, Ellen White here is talking about history, history in the sense that we see uh, in, in the light of prophecy through his word, that there is a purpose. These are not just random events. It's not just at the caprice and will of man that these things have occurred. Um, God has had a hand in what has happened. It is he has foreseen these events and, in a sense, guided them without taking away the free will of man um, so that we can clearly see he has allowed these things to occur so that we can clearly see um, the character of man in contrast to the character of God. <clears throat> so I write this here. These great reformatory movements are not just the pattern of history. They're the pattern of God's working with men whether on a cosmic scale or in the life of the individual, since it is all the outworking of God's character of love in restoring the image of God in man. The work of God in the earth presents. So this, so that first one was from Education 238. This next one's Great Controversy 343. Um, the work of God in the earth presents from age to age striking similarity in every great reformation or religious movement. The principles of God's dealing with men are ever the same. 
the important movements of the present have their parallel in those of the past, and the experience of the church in former ages has lessons of great value for our own time. So in the paper I go on, it says, we also recognize that this applies to the individual. The reformation that occurs in our lives follows the same pattern as seen in the great reformatory movements of the nation and the church. It is a three-step testing prophetic message, justification, sanctification, and glorification. It is exemplified in the work of the comforter, the Holy Spirit. So this verse john 16 verse 7 to 11 nevertheless i tell you the truth it is expedient for you that i go away for if i go not away the comforter will not come unto you but if i depart i will send him unto you and when he has come he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment so we see those three steps of sin because they believe not on me of righteousness because I go to my Father, and ye see me no more, of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. We also see this in the cure for our land to see in condition. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eye with eye salve, that thou mayest see, Revelation 3.18. So we can see clearly these three steps uh, that, that need to occur. And, and these all can be related to uh, the proclamation of the three angels' message, the everlasting gospel. I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth, this and the sea, and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying, with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So we can see in this three-step um, message, prophetic testing message, the three angels' messages, um, the first thing that we need to be able to see and understand is this pattern, which was first clearly seen in Millerite history, so um, many people are not familiar with Millerite history. I know all of you here who are live here right now do. You understand uh, many things about Millerite history, but um, if you can think back to your experience, um, if you were a Seventh-day Adventist prior, how little you understood about Millerite history. So if I use myself as an example, um, I was a pretty studious guy, read lots of books. I knew almost nothing about Millerite history. I knew lots about the history of the church um, after October 22nd, 1844, uh, but very little of the history of the church prior to that time. Um, I mean, I knew some of the key things. I knew there was Samuel Snow. Um, uh, I knew a little bit about what I'd read in the Great Controversy but I didn't even really understand it fully. And I definitely couldn't have told you the dates, the significant dates or waymarks in Millerite history. Uh, in fact, even up to 2013, where did, where did Jeff 
for instance, plays The Midnight Cry. Did he have a date for The Midnight Cry in 2013? Up to 2013. I don't recall. He did not. So if you watch Habakkuk's Two Tables, his series that he did in 2012 and finished um, in 2013, we didn't have a date for when the Midnight Cry was given. We just had Exeter. So we didn't have Boston, which is where it's first given. We only had Exeter, and we had no date. So we didn't have... Um, you know, the first day of the fifth month. But what about the first day of the first month, about the beginning, the first disappointment, as it's often called? Where where did Jeff place that um, up until 2013? Was it March 22nd or 21st? March 21st, right? So this was just how I would have looked at it as a Seventh-day Adventist. I'd say the first disappointment happened in March 21st because that was the date that Miller had originally uh, given. Uh, I mean, originally he didn't have any specific dates, uh, but he came to understand at, in December of 1842 that um, for the first time he presented that March 21st, 1844 would be the end of the prophetic periods. That would be as long as they could extend. Now, of course we extended them a bit further once we got into 1843, because they started to understand uh, that the year was going to start a month later. They didn't fully understand all the reasons for it. Um, so these are things, there's lots of things about Millerite history that we didn't understand 10 years ago. And, and this movement is, you know, 33 years old now. So, so for the first 23 years, we, we really didn't know this history. And, and there still are things that we're finding all of the time as we go back and we study. So, so one of the things that has to happen as, as we go through this series, um, we need to be able to lay out simply um, how Millerite history, and, and the way that I would do it is I would lay out how Miss Millerite history is first understood by the majority of Adventists, how we Maybe it's the minority, but any of those that have an interest in Millerite history, how they would understand this. And we have a Damsteed's book, and, and he has lots of these partial understandings of, of, of Millerite history, as more probably than you know most Adventists, but still lots of things that he's missing. Now, why is Millerite history... I use the word here, it's the template. You know, so a template is something, you know, if you're going to build something, you're going to make lots of copies of it. You create a template so you don't have to measure it every time. If you're cutting a board, you can just use a template. Um, but why, why do we have Millerite history as the template? Why is it the, the basic pattern? It's the uh, repeat of Millerite history. Okay. Okay. Repeat, Stephen. Yes. I was going to say about the parable of the 10 versions has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter. So it's like a pattern there. And also the seven thunders. The elimination of events that transpired on the first and second angel's messages and then relates to future events which will be disclosed in their order. Right. So, so we would think. I mean, these patterns have existed in the scriptures for thousands of years, right? These stories in the scriptures have these patterns. But our attention has never been drawn to them or directed to them in the way that it has been until the time of the end in 1989, right? So for the first time, God's people begin to look at this pattern, and it comes from Millerite history. Now, we can see, I mean, there are patterns that happen before Millerite history, but the template is given to us at the end. 
So God's going to give us this pattern to look at at the end of the world. And he's going to give this pattern that's at the end of the prophetic periods. So why didn't he just give us like the pattern in the story of creation or uh, even the three decrees occurs earlier? But we don't call that the template even though in some ways it's it's really the same history. The three decrees is the same history at the beginning of the 2300 days as it is at the end of the 2300 days. <clears throat> so I know this is, is review for all of us, but I do want to draw this line out. I want people to kind of see um, how this works. So even though this is, is review, we're still always going to be looking at this pattern. So this is the period of darkness. This is the 1260 years of papal supremacy. It's a period of darkness. Um, and then you're going to have 1798, the time of the end. And you're going to have an increase of knowledge. And then you're going to have some way marks, which we're not going to go into right now. Um, so this, this pattern, one of the basic things that we often neglect, though I focus on it quite a bit, is this idea that you have a period of darkness. And so when we start to look at these lines, we're going to look at them step by step, right? We're not, we're not going to just, you know, jump in and fill in um, the Millerite line just yet. But I'm going to show you here. But if I was going to look at other lines, like the first one in creation, you're going to have a period of darkness. And we call this, of course, the time of the end. But here you're going to have the time of the beginning. And then you're going to have, at that time of the end, you're going to have an increase of light. God says, let there be light, right? So we know that we have this here from the story of creation. And... We also have this from Millerite history. Now, if we looked at the captivity, you're going to have this captivity and there's different ways to look at it. It's, it's actually not as simple as this one, but, you know, normally we go to, um, you know, on the charts that says 538, but uh, you know, I'm going to put it here as 537 because the captivity itself is when uh, Daniel comes to the throne, which is in the fall of 537 BC. And this captivity is compared to this by the spirit of prophecy. So one of the things we will see when we look at Ellen White's writings is that she makes many of these parallels. She doesn't explicitly lay out these way marks but she actually does lay them out. Oops. Why is this falling? You get seasick with that there. Moving up like that. <clears throat> now, in this captivity, of course, this is the period of darkness. And we know that there's going to be these three decrees. So you're going to have Cyrus's decree and Darius's decree and Artaxerxes decree. Now, what do Adventists generally miss out about these three decrees? What do, we, what do we generally miss as Seventh-day Adventists about these three decrees? What would we generally say? If we're going to give a study on the 70 weeks of the 2300 days, 
what what do we say about the decrees? Well, Ellen White, she says that they were all needed. Okay, Ellen White says they're all needed. But what do Adventists mostly do? Go just to the third decree. Yeah, so we just go to the third decree and we just kind of say, which one is the correct one? But Ellen White doesn't do that. She says you need all of them. Because this history here at the beginning of the 2300 days is going to match uh, the first, second, and third angel's message. Though they're not written in the right spot here. But the first, second, and third angel's message, I just put them basically above there, at, that is going to come to the close of the 2300 days. Now, why is this important to understand if we're going to understand not just the prophecies, but if we're going to understand our lines, what's happening in our history? What is it that we see here about these lines? I mean, there's lots of things we see. But what, what are the primary features, the, the simplest features that we can see here? The pattern. Okay, it's a pattern of three steps, right? This three-step reform line. Okay. It's preceded by a period of darkness. It's going to have an increase of light. And another thing which we're going to get into is that you can't have a third without a first and a second. That is, you can't just skip to the third without the first and second occurring. Now, we'll see this, especially as we start to go into our own line, but we're, we're not going to get there right away. We're going to try to understand some of these lines in the past. Now, um, the other thing that we see is that we have a prophetic period, that these are are not just about uh, a reform, but they're actually parts of prophetic periods. Prophetic periods are attached to these, right? 1798 ends a period of 1260. The captivity is a period of 70 years, right? So we will find that the major, the great reformatory movements, these major lines all have time attached to them. Now, time can be symbolic or it can be literal. It is sometimes there are numbers that are attached to, to reform lines, especially in our time that have more symbols. We don't take them literally. Uh, they're, they're symbolic. Even, even if they're expressed later that we can see that there's a structure that's, that is based upon years or days or something like that, or weeks or months. Um, but even then, those would be symbolic, right? I mean, if you're going to have uh, a period of, let's say, 70 months or something like that, I mean, you don't have a direct prophecy there, but you have a parallel with something in the past or 1,533 days. There's all different kinds of, of structures. But... They're also pointing to an event. So this, you have this three-step testing prophetic message. Each of these way marks is a characteristic of an experience that God's people pass through, which is a re reformation, right? There's a reform going on. Now, what is a reformation? I mean, we have the word reform, which means to take something and form it again. But really, what is, okay, here's another way to ask the question. We know that there's a revival in Reformation. What's the difference between revival and Reformation? Because revival is part of a Reformation. Revival would refer more to an awakening. Right, okay. And if you have a revival but no Reformation, what happens? 
you have an awakening, but it never it never proceeds. Right. Yeah. And can you have a reformation without a revival? No. No. So so you need a revival. Now, in some ways, this first mes message is 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 a revival message. And the second message is a reformation message. At first, you know, people are awakened. Um, now, some people are awakened but don't want to accept the Reformation. And so they don't accept the first message, really. If you don't accept the second, you haven't really accepted the first. I mean, you may have woken up, but you need to have this second step, which is a change uh, that's going to occur. And that's the reforming that, that happens under a Reformation. But, but this whole thing is a reformatory line but it includes revival and reformation. But it also has this final third step, which is really the test itself, right? So these are in a sense preparatory uh, to that experience. Yeah, revival signifies a renewal of spiritual life, a quickening of powers of mind and Um, mind and heart, a resurrection from spiritual death. Reformation signifies a reorganization, a change in ideas and theories, habits, and practices. So both of these things are needed in a reform line. <clears throat> now, when we think about this on an individual level, so here we're looking at uh, prophetic ideas, but on an individual level, um, you know, because these are going to be reformatory movements, we, we brought out in the notes there that we have this progression that happens uh, sin, righteousness, and judgment. Uh, we have justification, sanctification, and glorification. We have this these steps that we go through as a Christian. And we know in the Bible it talks about, uh, you know, men love darkness rather than evil, or rather than light because their deeds were evil. And so on a personal level, we have a time before... So we have a period of darkness. This is our sin. And then we're going to have a point of time in which we are going to be awakened, right? So we're going to have this first step. And what is this first step? What does it include? Is this first step just one day an event or, or does it include other things? I would believe it includes other things. Okay. So if we think about our own personal experience, I mean, the first thing that happens is we recognize that we are a sinner, right? So wouldn't we not have conviction of sin? Okay. So we have conviction of sin. Is that all that's in the first step or is there something else? What would the next thing happen that, that's part of this first waymark? We're going to call this justification. What about confession? Okay, so you have conviction of sin and you have confession. So we're going to go here. This is one. This is your conviction of sin. And then you're going to have a second step. We're going to call confession. Con, C-O-M. Oh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, I don't know if we want confession. I'm not sure what that means. So confession, conviction, confession. And then we have a third step.
which we would call repentance. Now, how is repentance different from confession? Convection is uh, talking about it or telling it, and then repentance is, you know, following it up with actions. Okay. But even confession, so you've got first conviction. So we're convicted of sin. We see that we're a sinner, right? But then we have confession. So we don't just have this conviction. We actually have to confess our sins. You know, so if we confess our sins, he's able and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So confession is necessary. A person might see that he has a problem. But if he doesn't confess those sins, he can't experience the next one, which is repentance. So what is repentance? What does it mean? To turn around? Yeah, it means to go the other way, right? So repentance is doing a 180. So these three steps are needed for justification, are they not? Agreed. Okay. So we can see that within a waymark, we actually have three waymarks. Now, the way that we have done this, and, and it's, it's not necessarily wrong, is, I mean, you can look at this as going along in this line, that there are these waymarks. And what we would talk about is the arrival of formalization and empowerment of, of a message. But we can also see that this is really just zooming into this waymark, right? And then we, when we zoom into a waymark that we call justification or justification by faith, that we see that there are three steps. And, and you could actually zoom into each one of these waymarks and see that conviction of sin is not just, it doesn't exist just by itself, that there are steps in conviction of sin itself. You know, how do we come about to have conviction of sin? Well, it just it doesn't pop out of nowhere, right? So even the conviction of sin has, has elements. So first, light is going to come to a person, right? A man is going to... Uh, accept that light he's going to let that light whatever it is that message come to him he's going to apply it to his life he's going to see this problem right and what else does he have to do so he's going to see the problem he has to acknowledge it right in his mind right he has to spend time studying this his word when when we get a conviction of sin if i think about conviction of sin in my own life um and i think about the time i was converted you know august 11th 1980 um you know that's when i received justification but it it included all of these steps but it started long before i mean wasn't that wasn't the first time i saw that there was something wrong with my life because i actually tried to change myself. So often in this conviction of sin, there is a struggle with sin that we could we could actually create its own reform line with. Right? Yep. So these are the things that we're going to look at when we go through this study. The one thing we want to see is that this relates to us personally. When we're dealing with these reform lines, we're not just dealing with something that's out there. Um, as we move through a reform line, that is not just our personal reform line, but as we move through a reform line in history, in a prophetic line, we also go through these individually 
That is, that reform line is going to cause these experiences to occur in our lives on a deeper level. Because I had a conviction of sin a long time ago. I mean, I was baptized 40 years ago um, today. But I had been converted uh, a bit over two years before on August 11th, 1980. So I was baptized in 1982. Um, but even before that, I had this, this conviction of sin. So there's this whole process in which I was going through, but now do we get a conviction of sin still today? Do, as more light comes to us, do we go through this experience again? We do. Yeah. We, we experience a conviction of sin. We are renewed every day, Right. We, in a sense, go through this process of justification by faith on a daily basis, which we call sanctification. So the process of justification doesn't just happen at one point of time and it's over and done. It continues in sanctification. But sometimes it almost feels like we're starting over again. That is, so much light comes to us. We see our sin in a way that we've never seen it before. But we do this as we move through a reform line. So this is an important part of understanding these lines because God is speaking to us individually. He's not just speaking to a movement or to a church. You know, it is possible for us to, to be studying reform lines and not really take them seriously. It is often what we do is we, we study God's word. Ellen White says, you know, we don't bring it into the inner court. But his prophecy is something about that's out there, external events. But the thing is, we're tied to those events, our experience is tied to what's happening prophetically. Hopefully we can see that as we continue to go through these studies. And so we can't take lightly um, what these events mean. If we look at them just as external events and don't understand how they relate to us individually, personally, as we interact with the events of history unfolding, we, we could possibly lose out on the benefit that God is trying to provide to us, which is a transformation in character. And it's more than just a benefit. It's really salvational. Because if we are going to pass the tests that are before us, we need to have an experience based upon God's word. And it's not an easy thing. It's very easy to fool ourselves about our religious experience. So that's what I hope to get from this series. So I'm going to move slowly. I know I didn't really move as slowly as I could have today because you know I see my audience. I know that you're familiar with some of these things. But we're going to continue to examine these things. Even if we're reviewing, we're going to be going a bit deeper. Now, I know we, we started a little bit late and I don't want to go too long here, um, but it's, you know, it's a little bit, um, you know, it's about an hour right now that we've been doing this study. But can people see that this study will be beneficial for them as well as for people who are really just starting to look at these lines for the first time? If we move slowly. Yes, I think so. Okay. Yeah, so I don't, I don't want to move yes. too quickly. Yeah, thank you. I don't want to move too quickly, um, but neither do I want to uh, just be reviewing things that we already know. I want to look at these things more deeply. So I want people to pray on their day-to-day -day life and every day for these studies. I believe they're very important. And because um, there's many things that we've learned in the last year that um, would help if we understood them. And uh, so 
pray for one another. Pray for me. Um, pray for those that are, are going to be watching these videos. And, and I ask that people can share them, that use social media to share these videos. You never know who might, who might respond and how much impact they might have on their lives. There are many people who've come into this message recently through watching the videos on YouTube who have contacted me. Um, and they're just studying these things for the first time. And I feel sorry for them um, in that they have to uh, come in when there's so much information that they've missed out on. And so I'm hoping to present this uh, as something that's a little simpler. So it's not quite as simple as the studies I do Friday afternoon, um, because those ones are probably going to, they would probably take 10 years to get through if I moved at that pace. Um, but they are going to move a bit more slowly. Um, not as much detail, but, but a little bit deeper. That's, that's the idea. Okay, so let us close with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so very grateful uh, for the time that we have to study. We dedicate this time each um, each Sunday on the first day of the week um, to these studies in the afternoon. I pray, Lord, that those who need to see these things and hear them, uh, that you can lead them and help us, Lord, as we share these things, uh, to be open to your spirit, your guidance, and leading. Help us in our day-to-day -day lives as we struggle in this world around us, and help us to depend upon you in all things. We pray for each person again. We know how much darkness we can be in, even though we believe that we have the light. So help us to see our sin, to have a conviction. We can confess our sins and that we can forsake them. And we pray this and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.